This is Agriculture Adapts by Climate AI. Every week, we speak with industry-leading executives, farmers, and academics to get a 360 view of how the agriculture sector is innovating to stay ahead of a changing climate. I'm your host, Borna Porshikani. And I am your co-host, Himanshu Gupta. We are a team of climate scientists and agriculture entrepreneurs trying to make farming more resilient, profitable, and equitable as we transition to a new age of agriculture. This podcast is our journey as we explore the hurdles and opportunities that lie ahead for the industry that feeds the world. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Agriculture Adapt. With us today is Tatiana Schlossberg. She's the author of Inconspicuous Consumption, the Environmental Impact You Don't Know You Have, and a former New York Times science and climate reporter whose award-winning work has also appeared in The Atlantic, The Boston Globe, Bloomberg, and other publications. Tatiana, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. We'd love to sort of just start off by hearing from you about your background and your story and how you came to find yourself in the world of climate change and environmental journalism. I came to this mostly as a reporter. I was uh, working on the Metro desk at the New York Times before I started writing about science and climate change. And I wanted to do that for a few reasons. One, when I was a reporter at a newspaper in New Jersey, I had been there during Hurricane Sandy. Um, So I kind of was seeing that sort of firsthand, um, how people were dealing with these effects and of climate change. And I think that was sort of one of the big storms in this part of the world, in New York, where I live, where people really realize that, you know, these one in 100 year storms, that doesn't really mean one in 100 years. um, And it won't mean that anymore. It was really interesting and exciting. um, And, you know, bringing together all different kinds of people, but also, how science interacts with people's everyday life was really interesting to see. And then I, after working there, I um, got a master's degree in history at Oxford, and I read a lot of environmental history while I was there, which I hadn't really read before so much, but I really enjoyed it. And it was, I really liked thinking about, you know, again, this intersection of nature and people and science, um, but also, you know, seeing that climate change is a, you know, particularly new and um, intense phenomenon, but we've been dealing with versions of it for as long as people have been Mm -hmm. dealing, you know, extracting resources from the natural world. And so I read books about like fishing um, and coal extraction that really took the long view. And I think it's really hard to understand, especially, you know, the history of the United States without understanding our relationship to nature and resources. And then when I was at the New York Times, you know, it seemed like, well, there was an opening um, to work, to write about climate change. Um, And, you know, I felt like as somebody in my generation, this was going to be the biggest, most important story in the world. And I wanted to be able to tell it. And I think, you know, sometimes people are surprised that I don't have a science background, but I think or hope that that's actually a strength (laughs) because I can translate this information to an audience that maybe is more like me that doesn't automatically think that they are a science person. And, uh, you know, also the great part of being a journalist is that you get to learn on the job and, you know, call be curious for a living and, you know, call up an expert and they'll answer your questions. And, you know, you can say like, well, say it to me, like I'm someone who doesn't understand, but yeah. you know, of course I don't yeah. understand. So. <laughs> so that's kind of how I came to this and really have loved it. And I feel like, Yes, this is a science and nature and technology and energy story, but it's also a story about, you know, people and culture and history and food. And and there's so many ways to be interested in it and so many different things to write about. I totally agree. And I, and I, and I think that the approach that you take in your book is extremely unique and an extremely interesting one because it's it's very easy to have climate change turn into like a finger pointing game as well as just like, a ton of just scary facts that overwhelm people. And so oftentimes people run for the hills when they see a title that reflects climate change. Um, But I think your book does a really good job of talking about it in kind of a more, it's, it's in a more tangible way for people so they can relate to it, but it also sort of like engages and energizes people as opposed to leaving them feeling scared. Can you tell us a little bit more about the book? Like what exactly do you try to accomplish and what is the actual like meat of the book? So the book, um, as you mentioned, it's called Inconspicuous Consumption, The Environmental Impact You Don't Know You Have. So it's really about the hidden and unconscious um, environmental and climate effects of a lot of the stuff that we use, that we use and wear and eat and by how we get around every day. Um, and I wanted to do that because I felt like um, the scale of the conversation about climate change often doesn't make sense. Like on the one hand, it's 
a plastic straw. And on the other hand, it's a complete transformation of the electricity grid in fewer than 10 years. Um, and I think people feel like that doesn't make sense. Um, and so I wanted to kind of bring it into the context of their own lives without making people feel like, you know, this is how do I reduce my carbon footprint or what are all the things that I'm doing wrong and really to take a more systems level approach. Because I, I do think that, you know, focus on individual behavior has been problematic. I think that that narrative of personal responsibility is destructive because it, you know, makes us look at ourselves instead of these this larger global problem and also lets those who are actually responsible off the hook. So I, I wanted to you know, balance that, you know, the context of our own lives with these larger systemic global problems. So the I covered four major areas in the book, um, which are the internet and technology, food, fashion, and fuel. I want to dig into something that you said there. You said it lets those that are responsible off the hook. So how do you, how does this book hope to mobilize people to act? And what do you think is the change? So you mentioned that the book is about how climate change impacts and is impacted by the individual, but you also talk about how it shouldn't be left up to the individual to make those decisions because it is really hard to understand. Like, what is the climate impact of me going on Netflix? Like, should I buy this sustainably grown salmon or should I buy this like Alaskan fresh fish? You know, it's like there's right. there's so many different labels and it's hard to decipher as a consumer. So uh, the approach you take is trying to kind of pull that out. So what is the goal that you're hoping to achieve with this book? You know, we shouldn't feel individually guilty or for climate change, but we should feel kind of collectively responsible about building better systems and building a better world. So, and, and as you said, like we've put all the responsibility on the consumer to make the sustainable choice when we almost never have the information to be able to do that. But somebody does have the information to be able to do that. And that's the people who make the stuff that we're buying. If I'm standing in the store trying to figure out, or I guess, now, given the coronavirus, quarantine, yeah. <laughs> if I'm online trying to figure out which pair of jeans uses the least amount of water, like it's impossible for me to know which of these jeans is is more sustainably made. And but the companies that make them know how they're made, or they should. And so, what I hope people get out of this book is really, you know, understanding. Well, first of all, understanding what the problems are, because I don't think you can solve a problem if you don't understand the shape of it. And then realizing that, yes, individual behavior matters in that it's a place to start and these are good things to do, but they're not enough. And the things that are enough are these collective, these changes that come from collective action, which are, you know, things like voting, you know, not supporting companies that aren't at the very least transparent about their practices. So, um, and, and talking about climate change because people who are interested in this topic might talk about it all the time, but that's really like a third of Americans and, um, you know, two thirds of Americans don't talk about it at all. So I hope that people, if they read my book, will understand, you know, this isn't easy. <laughs> These are big changes that need to happen, but they need to happen. And when, and there are ways to make it better for everybody. So I hope that, that people kind of see that and see that there is a way for them to be interested and involved that, you know, and that these changes don't happen unless we ask for them. And I really like the way that you phrase, like you talk about the fact that it's not about feeling individually guilty. It's about feeling collectively responsible. And I think that's a super awesome way to think about this issue that I hadn't previously thought about. In your book and in other articles that you've written, you kind of talk about the nexus of climate change and food and agriculture. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you've learned at that intersection there? You know, I think Food is an area that a lot of us have heard a lot about, especially as it relates to its climate or environmental impact over the last decade or so in terms of things like buying local or if people read Michael Pollan's book and understanding kind of corn and um, the omnivore's dilemma. So I think what I wanted to do in my book was to understand whether or not the conventional wisdom that we had been offered over that last decade or so about buying local or buying organic, whether those things were really true. And so, you know, I found that you know, organic is sometimes a useful shorthand, but there are ways to be sustainable that are not organic. And the certification process can be meaningless <laughs> or it can be really powerful. And I think there's also kind of a fundamental uh, misestimation of like how much agriculture is organic. It's 1% of global agriculture. So, and, you know, it has lower yields within our current system. And so, you know, if we wanted to grow everything organically now, there are some, some people argue we would have to clear cut a lot of forests. So there are trade-offs with all of these different things. And so I, you know, I wanted to see, 
you know, find out about more about food miles or about food waste and buying local. So a lot of that is probably, you know, a lot of your listeners are familiar with. But I, I also wanted to write about um, the oceans because the ocean is so important in regulating climate change. And without the oceans, we would be on fire. Yeah. But also, you know, as it re- <laughs> as it relates um, aquaculture and and you know and is connected to corn in that way and how you know so many people about like I think a fifth of the global population depends on seafood as its primary source of protein and the oceans are being fished unsustainably and migration patterns are changing or species are you know becoming endangered and and how does that intersect with our you know agricultural food supply with either feeding fish corn or, you know, kind of the pollution and the pesticides from, from aquaculture. So, so there are a lot of, you know, different, and, and of course, then, you know, climate change will affect how we're able to grow food. And I know that's a subject that you guys have talked a lot about on here. So there's so much overlap. Um, and it is, I think an area where people feel like they're in control, um, because, you know, we decide what we eat for the most part, but it is Mm -hmm. of course an incredibly complicated global system as well. Yeah, we actually haven't talked about aquaculture at all on this podcast yet. So we'd love to kind of like dig in a little bit further there because it's something that a lot of people don't really think about. But when you when you're fishing in the wild, you're not like replenishing that resource. It's not like if you're growing corn or tomatoes where you're like taking it out and then you're putting a new one in. Right. It's like you're taking it out and you're not really putting anything in. And so the analogy is kind of like in in finance, you have like your principal and your interest. If you put in $500 into the bank, you might get $3 $3 on interest on that each year. And in the fishery, you ideally want to just be taking out that interest so you keep the same principle, that can't, the same base amount. But we're not really doing that. Like We're digging into the principle in a lot of cases right now. Can you tell us a little bit more about that issue? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, yeah, we, you're exactly right. We don't think about fishing as an extractive industry, but the way that we do it, it is. And, you know, the U.S., we have pretty responsibly managed fisheries and we've brought back a lot of our fishery our species from um, being overfished so so that's good <laughs> but we you know we're not in control of the whole ocean um, and there are a lot of countries that don't practice the same way that that we do so for instance China has bought up a lot of the fishing so every country kind of can that has coastline has an exclusive fishing right within 200 miles of its coastlines of exclusive economic zone. But China has bought up a lot of the fishing rights off the coast of West Africa. And they're fishing, particularly these really these small fin fish, very, very irresponsibly. And these fin fish are really important because they're kind of a feeder species for the, the whole ocean. So, you know, if those species disappear, you see that throughout the food chain. Um, and those those fish are being used for for things like fish oil um, or additives to food, but also for fish meal and fish oil to feed other fish for aquaculture, like farm salmon. You know, it, it, aquaculture is connected to the wild ocean in that way. Additionally, you know, I think since it's not like most people don't kind of have a sense of what aquaculture looks like, but it is also incredibly energy intensive. There are some estimates that like farmed catfish is more energy intensive than beef. Yeah, so it does have this this huge impact and that I think many of us overlook. But yeah, I think, you know, there are ways to fish that or you know, and uh, again, like one of the, the books that got me really interested in this topic is called The Mortal Sea, Fishing the Atlantic in the Age of Sail. So that's about kind of historical fisheries from basically like pre-contact uh, North America and then, you know, all the way through until sort of the Industrial Revolution. And what was really interesting to learn was that every kind of generation assumes that what it sees in the ocean is what has always been there. Yeah. So that's the, the new baseline. baseline. Yeah. Yeah. But we have shifting baselines because that, you know, this generation will see what it has and it will fish a species to the brink of extinction or to extinction or in, a, in an irresponsible way without understanding, you know, that it wasn't always like that and that these species are, you can't fish one species without having any effect on others. So there are ways to fish sustainably. There are ways to farm sustainably, I think, especially things like farmed um, mussels, farmed seaweed. I mean, that's not fish, but farmed, uh, sorry, farmed mollusks. Um, so like mussels and oysters, scallops, clams, you know, those like have a healthy effect on the ecosystem because they filter the water but, and they also don't require any inputs that people can just put them in the ocean. So there are ways to do it responsibly and ways to fish responsibly, but 
most of the ocean is not observed. So it's, it's hard to regulate. And there, you know, things like Global Fishing Watch, um, which are sort of trying to keep an eye on illegal fishing as a, as a great resource, but the market demands <laughs> always demands more and, you know, more and more people want to eat more fish. Yeah. And this is a tough one for me. Like I love eating fish. And so I was, I started doing a bunch of research on this to figure like, okay, I, I want to keep eating fish. What's the best way for me to go about doing that? And, and yeah, like the mollusks are a perfect example. Like eating low on the food chain is mm-hmm. really good. Anchovies, yeah. sardines, also usually pretty good. Yeah. And then going back to like the source of where the fish is coming from, that's a really interesting question because some fish is just is fed other fish, obviously, but like the right. the ratio at which they're fed that fish can be different. So if it's farmed sustainably, you might have a salmon that's eating like you feed it two parts of fish in order to get one part of salmon that a human will eat. Right. But in other places, you can have like eight to one. Like if they're feeding it like so much fish or so much fish is getting wasted in the process. And I want, I want to kind of hear from you, like how resilient are these fish populations? Like if you're, if you're deplete, and of course fish is a very general term, but in general, when you deplete fisheries, how do you bring that population back? Like, like does it bounce back in like five years if you just let it go? Do you ease restrictions or do you have to fully stop? Like how do people think about that issue? Well, it, it really depends. And also climate change is sort of confusing that process um, as well. So for instance, like the Gulf of Maine cod fishery, which was like, you know, a lot of the, you know, New England economy was built on cod fishing. And that was an incredible, it's like one of the most productive areas of the ocean. But cod have been totally overfished. That population has been decimated. The fishery, I think, has been closed since the 90s and is still not open. And Part of the problem is that, you know, the population got really low, but part of the other problem is that the Gulf of Maine is warming it faster than any other part of the ocean except the Arctic, and that's making it more difficult for fish to reach maturity or to breed. You know, additionally, like, you can set catch limits on, a, you know, a certain kind of fish in a particular region, but climate change will maybe be moving that fish. You know, it's looking for cooler waters, and so then the catch limits might be different in another state or country. So it's really, it's climate change is kind of confounding all of these already really tough problems. Um, so I think, you know, setting, and, and it's also really hard to count fish. Like it's hard to know how many really there are. So, but there, you know, there are, there are species that have, that have come back and, you know, Alaskan fish or Alaskan fisheries are pretty sustainably fished like, um, Pollock and Alaskan cod. And actually what's interesting is that it's people assume that you should buy something that's, unfrozen like fresh fish i guess but actually like if you're buying fish from alaska that was probably frozen right as soon as it was caught or pretty soon after so that's probably actually fresher than like if you get some other fish that has been either previously frozen or kept fresh the whole time but also what you were talking about before in terms of feeding fish like a lot of fish are also fed not fish but then they're fed like corn and so it, it connects to the industrial agriculture system that way so I think it's, you know, we have, we have to think of it kind of as one system and that we're managing, you know, species and ecosystem health and all at the same time. And usually things like conservation, restricting areas from fishing, restricting certain species from fishing, you know, those have climate benefits as well as, you know, biomass benefits. Yeah, totally. And again, like just the idea that if there was just a baseline that we could just trust, that would make things so much easier for the consumer. Because I, I still have trouble when I go into stores. I'm like, what? I'm like, which one is the most sustainable? Which one is is not going to feed me mercury? Like, <laughs> there's so much information to try to sift through <laughs> when I'm trying to buy a fish. Yeah, and there's some the Monterey Bay uh, Aquarium. I think the Marine Stewardship Council, they have like an app. Um, I mean, in Whole Foods, sometimes they'll list the rating, but there's also an app that you can look up different species and also the, you know, the species and where it's from, because it can be different in different places, you know, how sustainable it is or not. So that's a, a good resource too. You talk a lot about in your writing and in your, or in your normal journalism work, and then also in your book <clears throat> about uh, the issue of climate change and pollution as it pertains to inequality. Can you talk about the link that exists there, both historically and then how it applies today? Sure. Yeah, and it is a it's a big part of my book as well, mainly in the the chapter about fuel. So, climate change as a phenomenon is in some ways created by inequality. You know, the inequality between countries or between companies that allows some people to pollute a lot more than others, and then create a world that is warming. And then it also exacerbates inequality because the people who are both the least responsible for climate change 
are also the most disproportionately affected by climate change and the least able to recover if they do suffer from natural disasters or drought or famine or any of the other effects of climate change. And in in this country in particular, climate change, I mean, it's a is a justice issue. The and environmental pollution is a justice issue because we have a legacy of exposing different populations to pollution in different ways. So a uh, one example that I write about a lot is coal ash pollution, which is the residue that's left over from burning coal for electricity. And it contains you know, a lot of substances that are hazardous to human health, like mercury, arsenic, lead, cadmium, uh, strontium, lots of others. It's one of the largest solid industrial waste streams in the United States. We produce more than 100 million tons of it every year in almost every single state. Some of it is recycled quote unquote, meaning it's, um, yeah, what does that mean? Cement or, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, so there you. are like con- beneficial contained uses, like using it in cement and wallboard. And, but then there are also uses that are less safe, like putting it on roads to, um, dissolve snow and ice, but you know, mainly it's stored in water and it's, so it's, this dust is kind of flushed out of coal fired power plants in water and then stored in dammed off sections of rivers and lakes in these kind of man-made ponds where it is often in contact with groundwater. Um, so it can leak or, you know, it can, um, these toxic compounds can, can get into the groundwater that way, or, you know, can spill directly into the rivers and lakes that are nearby. You know, for example, in 2008, there was a, a dam at a coal-fired power plant in Tennessee collapsed, releasing billions of gallons of this toxic material into the river, buried 300 acres of land in toxic sludge. You know, it's one of the largest environmental disasters in American history, and I never heard of it. I didn't know what clim- what coal ash was until I became a science and climate reporter. You know, and additionally, you know, when when it was cleaned up, the waste was carted away to a landfill outside a predominantly black community in Alabama. The workers who cleaned it up were not given protective equipment, and I think about two dozen died. Another 200 more were made sick by their exposure to this pollution. So, you know, it's it's a luxury to not have to know what coal ash is. You know, I live in New York. I don't live near a coal-fired power plant, but, you know, every, people in Tennessee, in North Carolina, in Montana, in Virginia, you know, this is something that they have to deal with every day. And these, you know, disasters, even though we don't hear about them, these are kind of the big ticket, maybe attention-getting items in the news, but this pollution is happening every single day. And most coal ash ponds are leaking toxic material into the groundwater. And the people who are exposed to that pollution are disproportionately non-white communities, low-income communities in rural areas. And so, you know, that's just one example of how toxic material, toxic waste, pollution, you know, different communities suffer these effects differently and often purposefully. These you know, sites are often put next to these, you know, for instance, with the the landfill in Alabama, these are historically less powerful communities that have less influence and maybe are less likely to complain or be, be heard. And we, and we see the disproportionate effects in this in things like asthma, you know, heart disease, lung disease, you know, and also the, the first ever federal regulation governing the safe disposal and storage of coal ash was written or made, enacted in 2015 as a result of the 2008 spill that I mentioned. And the first thing that Andrew Wheeler did when he became EPA administrator was to roll it back. So, you know, we saw what happened when this, level, this enforcement of this problem was left up to states, and that's disaster. Um, and a lot of, you know, environmental lawyers and other people who work on this issue that I talk to say that this, you know, coal ash is the next big environmental disaster that's waiting to happen. Why is it the next big one? Like, why isn't it? I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of next big ones, but yeah. <laughs> but it's just one that's waiting to happen, I guess. You're saying like the disaster is waiting to happen or you're saying like the action that we take is, is has yet to come? No, I mean, so well, both. I mean, we need to have better regulation um, of this issue and also to stop burning coal. But the problem with coal ash waste is it's not going anywhere. You know, it doesn't biodegrade. And so we're, we have to figure out a permanent way to deal with it. And that generally is lined landfills, lined and covered landfills. But, you know, many of the existing ponds are held back by dams like the one in Tennessee that are, you know, more than 50 years old. And they're, again, like connected to rivers and lakes, places where people get their drinking water um, or fish or, you know, you swim or whatever, use it for recreation. And, and, and I think that 
they think that there's a lot of these dams are structurally unsound. Um, and additionally, a lot of them are in areas that are, um, you know, in the paths of hurricanes in the southeast. So in Hurricane Matthew, I think the one that was last fall, two years ago, like Hurricane Florence and Hurricane Matthew, both, there was a lot of worry about coal ash ponds being flooded and then releasing all that material and overflowing. Yeah, so, so climate change is just, again, going to make you know, stronger hurricanes, more rain, worse flooding is just going to exacerbate these problems. It's interesting because like this is it's the concept of like groundwater intrusion and like, like groundwater is not stagnant, like groundwater moves. And so a lot of these coal ash ponds, I mean, these, a lot of these coal facilities don't have the best environmental records. Like they'll, you know, <laughs> no. they get sued all the time for like having like uh, hazardous waste materials spill out illegally on a regular basis, which is, and the rules on that has now have now been made a little bit more relaxed, so they can kind of like do this a little bit, more, a little bit yeah, more often. Yeah, they've been made relaxed, and all in general, and then also during the COVID shutdown, they're being relaxed even further. So, um, oh, interesting. Just especially cynical. In an effort to like to make sure we have like, what's what's the claim? Is it? Is it I the, guess the rationale is like because it's expensive and you know. People Whoa, can't be that's paying terrible. attention to pollution at a time like this. Yeah. <laughs> when, you know, air pollution and other kinds of pollution make people have weaker lungs, which makes them more susceptible to things like coronavirus. So, yeah, the asthma rates around a lot of these facilities are insane. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, the, for, the, for the concept of groundwater, like this is no new idea for people in the ag industry. Like, like groundwater right. flows. And in California, we have a big issue with saline intrusion. So when mm -hmm. the groundwater gets depleted, salt water comes in. Um, and then we have an, an issue with having low quality water that we're feeding to the crops and we see lower yields. And it's like, yeah, that's from salt water. Try having like cadmium and arsenic in the water. Like it's 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 hugely problematic. And these are these are oftentimes in rural agriculture based areas. And you wrote a really interesting article about that Texas ranch and how they started off by leasing their part of the property to this coal facility and then it just took such a sharp turn for, for the negative. Yeah, so the, it was about this ranch in Texas where they, you know, a long time ago the ranchers leased to a well, coal mining company for the mineral rights. So they were mining for lignite coal, which is, that's, Texas is the largest consumer of lignite coal in the country. But Texas also, I mean, we hear a lot about how much energy Texas gets from wind, but Texas still gets 24% of its electricity from coal. And it's from this dirty, the dirtiest type of coal, least efficient. Um, so anyway, so they leased this land and um, for mining and then also a separate parcel for a coal-fired power plant to be built. And this was like in the era, towards the end of the era of rural of Texas rural electrification. So bringing um, electrification to farm communities that had, you know, been left behind. Yeah, these people were heroes. They were like, they're helping electrify, like rural, this was like a big issue and they were doing a huge positive for, for their area. Totally. But then the coal-fired power plant, you know, they had a coal ash pond, um, which is right next to this big cattle ranch the groundwater migration problem that you're talking about became an issue for them. I mean, I went there to this ranch, the area next to the pond. I mean, it's barren. It's the mud is like gray. Um, nothing grows oh, wow. there. And, you know, in other parts, it's like wildflowers and cattle grazing. And then, you know, additionally, they don't mine for coal there anymore, but they take the coal ash from the power plant and dump it into the old mines. And these are kind of like surface level mines they're so like they're not very deep um and then they these mines the old pits so they're filled with coal ash and then they get rained on so they're also filled with water <laughs> and they're hydrologically connected to a river the brazos river which is not that far away so and and that's also causing you know killing a lot of the vegetation and unsafe for the cattle to drink so the the ranchers don't let their cattle graze in that area anymore and you know, they're not getting any help from the state. There's no oversight. Uh, dumping coal ash into old coal mines is considered a beneficial reuse. It's such structural fill. But I think it's really, you know, when you say it out loud, it's like, how could anybody let that happen? <laughs> and that's what we're dealing with all over the country. And I think, you know, again, like, it's so easy for us to be so disconnected from the consequences of, you know, using electricity. And one of the examples I talk about in the book is how, you know, a lot of the internet is located in 
um, Virginia and Ohio, and Ohio in particular still runs on a lot of coal. I mean, both places use a lot of fossil fuels, but Ohio uses a lot of coal. Amazon has a ton of data centers there, so and Amazon Web Services hosts a huge amount of the internet. So I think you know, if I'm using the internet in New York, like I don't have to be, a, you know, and that's creating a demand for electricity to be burned. I mean, electricity to be generated in Ohio, and that's creating coal ash pollution for somebody else who is, you know, most likely a poor person of color in a rural community. And so I think it's, you know, I'm not saying that like shopping on Amazon therefore makes you a bad person, but that we are all part of the system um, and we're all connected to these consequences and, you know, a, a society that allows certain people to suffer disproportionately the consequences of pollution is a society that is less just for all of us, but also we're all part of this. So we are all responsible for fixing it. Yeah, and the stats around like the the inequality question are pretty astounding. Like the N- I think the NAACP says like seventy percent of African Americans in the U.S. live fairly close to a coal-fired power plant, which is pretty insane considering all of like the health implications that exist around it. Yeah, and it's not just things. Something I mean, as necessarily dramatic as a coal-fired power plant, like black and other, um, you know, non-white communities are more likely to live next to major roads Mm -hmm. in cities and next to highways and suffer from air pollution that way. And I think like, we don't necessarily think of inhaling pollution from cars as like equivalent to a coal fired power plant, but like you're breathing that in. If you live there, you're breathing that in all the time. Discriminatory housing policy over many generations in the U S has led to that disproportionately affecting those communities as well. Yeah. And then just to go back to the to the cattle ranching situation, like when a lot of times when people think of mines, they think of like a very almost like concrete thing that you're like a pit that you're going in. But right. a lot of times these mines are like not super rigid and, and it's and it's fairly easy for liquid to flow out of it. And that's why it's problematic. So like when you think of a mine, sometimes people think like hard rock or some sort of right, like, like in a mountain. casing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like in a mountain. But that's not the case for a lot of these. And so it's you're just putting it in and then it's just <laughs> it's just going right. It's just going right back out. And then, yeah, I'm curious to see like with that rancher that you were speaking with, were they noticing any differences in their cattle? Like when their cattle was eat? Is that why they stopped letting their cattle graze there because they were seeing impacts on them? Or, or was it just like a common sense? Like we probably shouldn't let our cattle graze here. You know, I don't remember if the cattle were getting sick or dying, but I, I think the the impacts on the, I mean, there was nothing really for them to eat there, like all, because all the grasses were dying. Um, and then I think they assumed that it would be, that then the cattle would be drinking that water. And so they stopped, but I don't, I don't actually remember. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe we don't let the cattle <laughs> feed on the post-apocalyptic landscape. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Might not be the best thing. You were talking about Maine and this was, I wanted to bring this up earlier, but we kind of, we had some really interesting conversations to dig into, but I want to, want to pull it back to this. So you were talking about how Maine was being impacted, but you also, in some of your writing, talk about how Maine is starting to adapt to a lot of the changes that they're seeing, uh, particularly as it pertains to Arctic trade. Can you talk a little bit about how Maine is adapting to climate change and how they're, and this is like, so, so climate change is, is a very broad issue and adaptation is also a very broad issue and it's going to require people to change the way that they operate in the economies. And as we say in the intro of this podcast, it's challenges and opportunities. And this is a case where Maine is trying to make use of an opportunity. So curious to get your thoughts and, and key learnings from that article. Yeah, and that's so important that you say this is an opportunity. I think so often we talk about climate change only as an issue of loss um, and sacrifice. But, it, you know, as we're saying in these conversations around justice and, and remaking our consumption patterns in our systems, like this is an incredible opportunity to do things differently um, and to make more equal and better systems. So, but in terms of this article that I wrote about Maine, so this is actually something I came across when I was researching my book that there were some people in Maine, like people in the business community and also some politicians and policymakers who were looking to establish commercial relationships with Arctic countries. Because the idea being that in decades or the in, in several years or hopefully longer than that, um, Arctic sea ice will disappear, especially uh, year round, but at first in the summer. And then you could, you could shave off a lot of time of shipping goods from Asia to the U S by going through the Arctic. And if ships were coming to the East coast of the U S the first stop would be Maine. And so they were trying to kind of establish themselves as like a 
bigger port city and establish trading relationships with with other Arctic countries in anticipation of Arctic shipping being a bigger part of the global economy. And so they were kind of building relationships that way. They had sent trade delegations to Iceland and Norway. They were, in, you know, increasing. They had um, recruited an Icelandic shipping company to establish its North American headquarters in Portland. You know, they That's were Portland, Maine, not not Portland. Portland, Oregon. Maine, yeah, yeah. Um, and they were, you know, increasing exports of Maine blueberries and Poland spring water to Norway, and uh, you know, trying to set up exchanges and you know, school exchanges and things like that, and also to have more Arctic cruises stop in Portland or leave from Portland, as well. And there are like civil engineering firms that were, you know, making contact in Greenland in anticipation of Greenland's permafrost melting and uh, mining becoming a bigger industry there and also, you know, building port cities to accommodate ships, you know, cruise ships and also, you know, ships for for trade and mining and things like that. So that part kind of sounds problematic, though. Like, (laughs) is is that are there regulations being placed around that today or is this is is it just kind of like around mining in Greenland? uh, Yeah. In the Arctic in general. The so the problem with the Arctic is that there's I mean, Greenland belongs to is technically part of Denmark. Um, so I assume that they would have, they would be responsible for the regulations around mining there. In the Arctic in general, governance is really complicated because, you know, you have those exclusive economic zones off the coast that, that we talked about before. So the U.S., like we are an Arctic country because of Alaska, but Russia and Canada have much more <laughs> Arctic territory than we do. And, you know, people can mine within their exclusive economic zone. And Russia is already, um, you know, they've built a ton of cities in their Arctic ports. They have one icebreaker. We have a second one that we like use for parts for the, to fix the other one. Russia like built, has built 46 in the last couple of years. And these Um, are ships that can like penetrate through. Yeah. They can break up the ice. Yeah. You know, I think ocean mining is like a huge issue that could cause enormous problems in the in the ocean going forward, this like industrialization of the ocean as we deplete more and more of the resources on land. So, you know, the Arctic Council is sort of the body that regulates the Arctic and all of the Arctic nations like have a seat on it, but it really has no enforcement power. And then, you know, other countries and indigenous groups can have an observer status. What does the Arctic Council actually do? It sounds like something that's like out of Game of Thrones. Like what are they what are they <laughs> <laughs> so what are they, they like do? Yeah, so they meet regularly, like the kind of, you know, foreign ministers, secretaries of state will meet. And like every two years, the chair of it rotates. So when we were the chair, actually, one of the meetings was hosted in Portland, Maine. And that was like a very big deal because it was the first time it had ever been hosted outside of the Arctic. But, you know, they talk about some of these issues that that we're talking about. I mean, the biggest thing that they were have been able to do was negotiate this agreement of stopping fishing in there's like kind of an open circle of water in the middle of the Arctic Ocean that's surrounded by ice and to not fish in there. There's a moratorium on commercial fishing in there. So that was something that they were able to achieve together, which is, you know, really important because the Arctic is kind of one of the last, if not the last, like wildlife refuge in the ocean that's available to animals. So, but anyway, so I was really interested in this issue about the Arctic and who controls it and how to if people are going to profit off it. And, you know, on the one hand, it's like, you know, Maine, as we talked about before, has already experienced, you know, disproportionate effects of climate change from warming in the Gulf of Maine, and that has hurt their, um, some of their industry. And they are the poorest state in New England. They're one of the poorest states in the country. So if they can gain some economic benefit from this, these relationships, like, is it fair for me sitting in New York to say that they shouldn't be able to do that? And additionally, like, Arctic sea ice is melting. <laughs> it will be gone. Summer Arctic sea ice will be gone. And so isn't it better to plan for that and to, you know, for us to be the people who are planning that and people who are responsible and people who care rather than ceding all of our authority to Russia or China or Canada and, and, you know, having the Arctic develop in an irresponsible way. Like, don't we want to seat at the table? But at the same time, like, the idea of profiting off climate change 
feels wrong. <laughs> and like, yes, we do have to plan for the inevitable, but also like what happens in the Arctic affects the whole rest of the world. And, you know, there are so many kind of dangerous consequences of things like Arctic shipping, you know, if ships get stuck or oil tankers are going through there and, you know, heavy fuel oil has not been banned in the Arctic yet. So if there's a crash, if there are more icebergs moving around, it's more dangerous. If oil spills and under ice, we don't know how that reacts. And so there are all kinds of questions around the safety and sustainability and should people really be doing this and, and how do we plan for that? And so I was interested in a lot of those, a lot of those questions, like how do you plan for climate change and adapt to this changing world and do so in a way that's responsible and allows those communities that have suffered or will be disproportionately impacted going forward, you know, to be able to respond and preserve some economic benefit in, in a changing world. Yeah, that makes sense. Because I totally agree. Like, we would want a seat at the table. And at the same time, we want to make sure what's happening there isn't exploitative. So it's a, it's kind of a difficult line to walk. Totally. Yeah. No, and it, like, you know, Angus King, the senator from Maine is really bullish on this. And I interviewed him for my piece. And he was like, this is happening, <laughs> you know, like yeah. we have to have a plan for this. Um, and we need, you know, he tried to get more money for icebreakers, which was cut from the budget. But like, it's also incredibly important in terms of like national defense that we are able to navigate and patrol the Arctic for, especially if there are ship strandings or things like that. Like, and if we, you know, if we don't have the equipment to be able to do that or the infrastructure or the diplomatic relationships, like you know, then we have no say over or how that develops going forward. Yeah. What, what was your sense after talking to him? Did you feel like they were set to be doing this in a pretty sustainable and fair way? Or did it seem like there was kind of an exploitative angle that was coming about? I mean, all the people I talked to bristled at the suggestion that they were taking advantage of climate change or that they wished they wanted it to be happening because, of course, they don't. But you know, at the, at the same time, you have to be realistic and, and as we're saying, adapt to the world that, that we're going to live in. So I think my concerns were, I think, different from what they were thinking about in terms of things like the stuff that I mentioned about ships being stranded or crashes with icebergs or how it affects migration patterns of um, marine mammals, fishing. And I think that may, there's a, my sense was that even though they wanted to be responsible and know that, you know, Maine's entire economy depends on the kind of its environmental quality in a lot of ways in terms of things like their drinking water, like Poland Spring, but also like oysters and lobster and fish, timber, blueberries, like they get it. But um, at the same time, I think that they were they didn't weren't necessarily taking this kind of like hemispheric or global view of what the consequences of this kind of thing is. Yeah, and so you mentioned like timber and blueberries. What else are they sending in as part of this trade? Because they're they're definitely not send, they're definitely not sending that cod anymore. So what what else what else are they sending? They're sending lobster. Um, okay. They're sending potatoes. They're sending. I mean, candles. Perversely, like we send lint chocolate, which is European from Maine to lint chocolate. <laughs> yeah, like L I N D T. Is... You know that Swiss chocolate. It's like a okay. chocolate maker. But anyway, like they manufacture it in America and we make certain flavors that we then ship to Europe, even though like it's a Swiss company. So anyway, there are lots of weird things like that, but, yeah. but also a lot of like specific main things um, like like the stuff that I mentioned. And is it mostly just Maine stuff or is, or is, is Maine becoming a hub for like the entire New England region to kind of send stuff to be shipped through? Yeah, they are getting more stuff that then they're, you know, from these countries that then they can, you know, send to other parts like to Boston and New York and sending stuff from from here to there. A huge thing actually that uh, is Maine beer, like IPAs are very popular um, in, in Arctic countries. So that's another thing that they're sending and I think kind of regionally. But it, it's not like a huge center of global trade. The port's just not big enough, but it is kind of like a niche market Um but, you know, I think that they're they're hoping that, that that relationship is strong enough that it, you know, keeps going or, you know, grows with increased shipping in that in, in the Arctic. Yeah, it makes sense. Awesome. Well, is there any way that people can, or I guess, how can people support your work, both your journalism, your book? 
whatever your next, you know, your YouTube channel you're going to create. What, <laughs> how can people support, uh, support you and your work? Well, the best thing to do is if you like what you heard today, um, buy a copy of my book, which you can buy from your local bookstore online. I'll link, to, I'll, I'll link to that as well in the show notes. Yeah. Um, or if you enjoy the sound of my voice, I read my own audiobook. Um, so <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That. I didn't know yeah. that. Otherwise, you know, I write a newsletter with some of my various musings about climate change um, and the environment. So I don't. Uh, so people can subscribe to that. It's a tiny letter. Um, it's called News from a Changing Planet. There's a link to it on my website. You can subscribe on my website, which is tatianaschlossberg.com. You can follow me on Twitter, at Tater Tatiana. Love that. Yeah, that, those are those are the main ways. And, you know, any words of encouragement or ideas for other books. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really enjoyed this conversation. I learned a ton. And yeah, thanks so much for joining us, Tatiana. Yeah, me too. It was fun. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you have any feedback or you'd like to add your own two cents on the topic discussed today, or if you've just got your own ideas about something that we should discuss in the future, please feel free to shoot me an email at podcast at climate.ai. At its core, this podcast is just a way for us to learn and we want to share our learnings as we go. So we're always open to building on these conversations and hearing new perspectives. Thanks for your support and see you next time.